Hello, I'm Professor Matthew Schmidt, and this is Genetics. In today's session, we're going to ask a question which almost sounds overly simplistic, and that is, what is the function of a gene? I hear some of you saying, well, isn't that what we've been talking about the whole time? I mean, a gene controls a trait, right? Well, that may be true and it may not be true, but given our newfound, in the context of this course, knowledge about the structure of DNA and the fact that somehow DNA is what genes are made of, we really need to ask ourselves a couple of questions and say, yeah, Mendel you know, implied that one gene controls one trait, but what does that really mean at the more molecular and biochemical level? And certainly we're not going to quite get there yet, but we need to explain, well, we're going to start to get there, how the gene, whatever it actually may be, in fact controls the phenotype in reality. So this is part of the section called Mutations and the Nature of the Gene. We're really going to get at the nature of the gene in this section. We're going to use some of the knowledge that we learned about mutations last time in order to be able to do this. So uh, there's a really landmark set of experiments that were published in 1942. If you'll think about when that was, it was a full 14 years before Watson and Crick actually published their structure of DNA. So this was understood, you know, it was sort of going together at the same time. It's so important to realize that structure and function are so intimately related but there are different ways of getting at structure and function. So while Watson and Crick and others were working on DNA, structure, chemistry, etc., um, it's also important to be working on the function. Ultimately, the two have to be able to mesh together perfectly, right? So these experiments, it seems like we're going back in time, but in a sense, these were two trajectories that eventually are going to come together, all right? So two very famous scientists called Beadle and Tatum did these experiments, and they performed experiments using the mold Neurospora. I think we mentioned it once before when we were talking about mapping centromeres. And really, I'll probably get very overexcited about this, but this really revolutionized our idea about how genes work. Remember, the key thing here is function, not so much structure. Sometime, we're going to have to be very clear about how the structure relates to the function. But it turns out that Beadle and Tatum were interested in the biochemical pathway. They were using this pathway that allows synthesis of the amino acid arginine. And they were also interesting, interested in the relationships of genes to this pathway. So without any genetic knowledge, biochemists knew that there was a pathway. And by the way, you may know this, many, many um, biochemical reactions occur in these multi-step sort of pathways, and they can be worked out, I'm not going to say easily, but it's certainly done and a lot is known about it. So basically they said this, if you take Neurospora and you grow it on what we call a minimal media, which means they're just the real basic precursors of, of things there, they can grow, but you know they're doing a lot of things, but what's relevant to this pathway is they can start out with some precursor molecule and ultimately build it into arginine, which is an amino acid. I'm sorry if I already said this. All living things need arginine. Um, humans, as an example, we can only synthesize roughly half of the amino acids we need. The other half we have to consume. Um, organisms like this can probably make all of them, but one thing is for sure, they know how to make arginine. It was also known that this process actually took place in a stepwise fashion. So some uh, precursor molecule, which you don't have to really care what it was, what really was going on was that was being converted into a substance called ornithine. If you want, you could almost think of that as a, a pre-amino acid. That ornithine was getting converted into citrulline, which is another sort of pre-amino acid, and ultimately the citrulline was being made into arginine. So this was known. Furthermore, it was known, you guys probably know this already, isn't it true that every uh, biochemical reaction requires an enzyme to both facilitate and control that reaction? 
Yes, it is true. So right now we don't need to worry about the names of the enzymes, but the bottom line is that what we've sort of arbitrarily called enzyme X here was responsible for this reaction, making the precursor into ornithine. Then an enzyme we're going to call Y was responsible for the next step where ornithine was converted into citrulline. And finally, enzyme Z allows the citrulline to be converted into arginine, which is the end product that's necessary. So, so far, that's what they knew. But then they got into some genetics, and we're going to combine genetics and biochemistry here. So what they did was, now we're still trying to get at gene function. They mutated spores of Neurospora and isolated various oxytrophic mutants. We used that term once before. An oxytroph is an organism that is not able to synthesize something that a vital nutritional compound that the wild type can. So oxytroph means that it needs to be fed that particular item in order to, it has to be supplemented basically in order to grow. The opposite of an oxytroph is a prototroph, just in case you want to get that terminology down, a word which literally means before the feeding. So in other words, prototrophs can make everything they need to grow before they get fed or supplemented with things uh, in the medium, the media. So oxytrophs, they just started basically collecting mutants that they found could not make arginine after they had mutated them. I don't remember what they did. Maybe they irradiated the spores. We talked about last time the various ways that you could induce mutations. So they just started cataloging these mutants. They called one Arg minus number one, Arg minus number two, Arg minus number three. They collected a whole bunch of them. So obviously I'm going to be, be solidif I should say, condensing this data and presenting it to you in a much simpler fashion than they did. But it turns out, so look what they did. They're causing genetic mutations, clearly. And they're finding out that some of these mutations disrupt somehow this pathway that they know to be occurring. And how do we know that? Because they can't make arginine anymore. One of the things that they did was to show that if they added arginine to the, to the medium, the, they could grow. So with arginine around, they're good. Without it, they're not. Thus, oxytrophs. Now, three. they did a lot of stuff that we're not going to talk about, but in particular, there were three mutations, which we're going to call Arg minus 1, 2, and 3, and they did some genetic mapping of where the mutations existed by some similar uh, methodology to what we've discussed in the past, and they found something really exciting and interesting. All three of these mutations were mapped to three different chromosomes. Neurospora has a lot of chromosomes. What this means, though, is since we know that a gene is located on a chromosome, this means that even though the phenotype was the same of all these, what's the phenotype? It's that they're arch minus. They don't make arginine. But these three mutations, all which had the same phenotype, had problems in three different genes based on the mapping evidence. Now, there's a table here that shows some growth data for these three different oxytrophs. This, I've seen um, people get confused about this data before. I think it's mainly just a matter of reading it correctly. So let's just take a minute to make sure we understand what this is saying, okay? So here are the three different oxytrophic mutants, Arg minus one, minus two, and minus three. This O stands for ornithine, this C for citrulline, and this A for arginine. So basically, this is what it means, okay? If you take the mutant Arg minus number one, here's the deal. If you give it arginine, we know that that's going to allow it to grow, right? And you see that plus there means growth occurs. But interestingly for this one, look, if you give it citrulline, it also can grow. You may be seeing what this means, but...